Good morning, everyone. I would like to greet each one of you from this wonderful country and the beautiful city, the pearl of the world, Istanbul. I wish all of you very good morning and this is a very honorable moment and we are really proud to be with you sharing this, these wonderful moments with all of you. First of all, I would like to say that we are here with this wonderful university, Medipol University, and I am really proud to give you some information about our wonderful university. Medipol University is a name very much perceived among the higher education institutions of Turkey. And I'm glad to impart to you that it has gotten the prime decision for higher studies. Right now at the moment, I am in one of the classrooms of our prestigious and uh, a very big populated part of our university, which is called English Preparatory School. During the previous 11 years, it has formed into one of the biggest multidisciplinary colleges and the pioneer of progress in education service. It is our most noteworthy objective to raise inventive and ambitious people concentrated on science and innovation creation. Medipol is gaining a remarkable momentum in academic popularity in a sense that it has engrossed students from around the globe thanks to its highly enlarged infrastructure with state-of-the-art research centers equipped with high-tech laboratories. In 2020, this year, we positioned in the top colleges on this world list on this world list reported by Times Higher Education and Round University Ranking, THE and RUR. Now we are in the list of 400 plus universities amongst all those young universities. The vision of Istanbul Medipol University is to be a model university in our country and the world through its enormity in training and practice. A goal to show gifted people who are glad to shape the destiny of the network and incredible educational staff and present day establishment. For the time being, you can see the video that I'm sharing with you from the several screenshots of beautiful Istanbul and our wonderful university. As you can see, our university is located in the center of Istanbul, very near to the Bosphorus, the beautiful pearl of the world. As you can see, some shots from our university, the dormitories, and this is our famous research center with 200 million US dollar investment. And we are doing here lots of biomedical, medical, genetics, microbiological, and cancer researches. And this is our, one of our 10 hospitals, the biggest one with 800 beds. In this hospital, we can have at the same time, 45 operations. Along with the hospitals, we have four dental hospitals. And as you can see, this is the biggest laboratory in 
dentistry faculty with 200 phantoms, 200 dental students, dentistry students at the same time can work on these phantoms. And we are equipped with most modern laboratories in the world. As you can see in this picture, our media center, we have a new studio, normal studio and a pocket movie theater for 80 students to be able to study at the same time. We have wonderful, and you can see, end year ceremony. And we are really proud to have more than 30,000 students, Turkish students, and around 1,500 international students. This is our biggest campus. We believe that being a piece of Medipol is getting ready for tomorrow. Today is superior to yesterday. The commitment to shaping the tomorrow rests with us and you. We look forward to welcoming you and invite you to shape the future together. We want you to touch your future with us. And we will be very happy to see you all here. We want to welcome all of you. Our friends in this fair will be ready to give you answers about your questions in your academic studies and careers. Not only our international office, but also our academicians will be ready to answer your questions. I hope this video with the help of our higher education council will be useful to you. Thank you for participating. Have a good day. I hope you can see the screen properly. Yes, we can see. Okay, perfect. And that's, that's very nice. So, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much and a very good morning to all, all of you. Um, I think uh, I got a little, uh, I'm late or on the other hand, we'll start, but again, it's a privilege and uh, I'm really, very grateful that uh, you guys gave me the opportunity to be here today with all of you. And um, what I wanted to discuss today with all of you is very, very critical. And on the other hand, something very important, especially to the young generation who's going to be joining very soon. So, well, uh, it's all about my, as I said, my topic of discussion for today is why, I mean, one second, please. Yes, Istanbul Medipol University leading to a promising future. Well, my name is Dr. Omar Khalid Bharti. I'm an associate professor at the School of Business and Department of Business and Management. Before I actually begin, let me give you a very brief intro about myself. I have a PhD in business. Uh, from IIU Malaysia. I have been associated with the Maripol University for last two years and a half, and it has been tremendously a very, very uh, exciting and on the other hand, a very learning experience that I have covered so far with Maripol University. So without any further ado, as I said, I will be discussing Istanbul Maripol University, which is leading to a promising future. So before I begin, I think I better need to 
give you a little bit of heads up about Turkey. I think most of us know Turkey very well. And uh, if we look at the overall history of the Turks, it covers a time frame of more than 4,000 years. I'll not go into too much of history details, but some things are very important for us to know that the Turks, they first lived in the Central Asia around 2000 BC. So later, some of them left for Central Asia and spread around establishing many states and empires, which were independent from each other, with a vast area of Asia and Europe. So these empires, if we go back to the history, they included the great Han Empire, all right, the Gokturu empires, the Uyghur empires, and the Avar empires, and even the Hazar, and the, the, there are many others as well. So the Turks in the Anatolia, I mean, they started settling in the Anatolian in the early 11th century, all right? And we have seen that after the victory of the Melgris victory, which was in 1071 against the Byzantines, it literally opened the gates of Anatolia to the Turks. And it is following this day that the Turks fully, you know, conquered Anatolia and established the overall Anatolian state, which was from 18, uh, sorry, 1080 to 1380. So, as I said, I would like to keep it very brief. So, the Ottoman age, we already know, 1299 to, uh, 1299 to 1923. And of course, I mean, the Ottoman age showcases a marvelous expansion and on the other hand, a rich history and a heritage that we see by looking at the history. And of course, the Republic of Turkey, which was proclaimed in October 29, 1923, and uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk was selected as the first president of the Republic of Turkey. The reason of giving you all of this very small brief history was to make you understand that how rich and deeply rooted culture and history Turkey has. And that is one of the greatest experiences that you can actually cherish if you are here in Turkey. As I said, it's been three years, almost three years for me to be in Turkey and every day is a learning experience. Every day is an experience that makes you see things differently from a very different lens. The question that comes in in any single person's mind is, and especially at your age, at your stage, that why one needs to study in Turkey? So going back to my point, this was the main reason that I started off with a very small brief history of Turkey, just to give you the glimpse of this beautiful country and this beautiful, you know, ge geographically located country, Turkey, that why is it so important for us to understand that, you know, why one needs to think of joining Turkey for their higher education. So, as I said, with this in mind, we need to understand that Turkey, as I said, provides a very rich culture. And with its multicultural life, then I said, and then I tried giving you a little bit of the history about it. Turkey has hosted many deep-rooted civilizations in its territory for thousands of years. It's a mixture of cultures, and that's the biggest beauty of being in Turkey. And in this country where countless civilizations have been hosted, everyone, and I must say everyone, is tolerant and respectful to each other. In Turkey, where you can find a piece of your roots and perhaps there are very strong possibilities that you can find people who will speak your language. And this is what is ideal for any student to find that conduciveness. And of course, as, as a student, it is also important that you have a safe and a peaceful environment and Turkey offers that. So yes, Turkey, the first reason that you should consider of being in Turkey and studying in Turkey is because of its multicultural life. And on the other hand, the most important thing is the quality of higher education. Please note that Turkey is the second country in the world which has the highest, or you could say, the most, uh, you know, higher level of higher education with almost 94.2% uh, 
schooling rate. And that's amazing. This shows the, the commitment the country has in terms of providing best education for every single member of the society. Of course, uh, there's one more important point that you have to consider and you need to keep in mind that why should you choose Turkey to study? As I said, university and the program diversity. If I'm not mistaken, and if my uh, data is correct, there are 207 universities in Turkey with a total population of near about 82 million, all right? So the number of students is close to 8 million. And with this number of students, Turkey is the first country with the most students in European higher education area. That's a very massive and big achievement. And there are nearly 60,000 different programs in those 207 universities, which they offer to their students. So in such a variety, I can assure you that you will definitely find a university and a program for yourself that would cater your particular needs and objectives and Medipol does the job well. Apart from this, of course, I mean, no one can deny the fact that Turkey has been blessed with some very beautiful natural beauties. So the, the sweetest thing of Turkey, apart from the baklava and the sweets that they offer is the seasons. You experience four seasons, all right? And it, Turkey has a reputation of its natural beauty. I mean, you go any part, anywhere. I have been very lucky to travel all over Turkey, starting from Ankara all the way to Antalya and even all the way to Van. And yes, it is, it is just like, you know, you are experiencing, uh, you know, heaven. I must say, I mean, if you, if you want to enjoy swimming, you want to enjoy water sports, you want to enjoy skiing, you know, mountain climbing, rafting, everything Turkey offers starting even to the extent that extreme sports are also something that is there. So you actually feel in heaven in Turkey. And there are countless, countless beauties which shall only fascinate you with their landscape. So it's, it's a paradise. It's a paradise to be in. And nothing like being here as a student and experiencing all that beauty and cherishing it for the rest of your life. Again, uh, I go back to my same point that based on the long history that Turkey has, there are thousands of historical and cultural monuments in Turkey. Uh, most of them are protected as UNESCO cultural heritage. And even in my daily life and in your daily life, once you'll be here, you will want to keep a track of track and traces that you may encounter frequently. So as I said, the historical and cultural heritage is immense in Turkey. With, on the same, and uh, in, in view to what we are discussing, yes, the, I mean, why, one of the major questions that come across anybody's mind is that if I'm going to another country, if I'm going to another uh, place, what type of campuses or what type of facilities do they have? So let me assure you that uh, Turkey in general provides very modern and technologically advanced campuses. No matter which of the 207 universities you go, you will experience a very modern and a very convenient campus life, which is equipped with the latest state-of-the-art technology. And as I said, Medipol offers you the same. Of course, uh, even when I was uh, a student and I was studying in Malaysia and I was also traveling around, there's always one thing which, uh, you know, becomes a great concern for you, and that is easy living conditions. Uh, I must say that with all the experience that I have in last 15 to 20 years of traveling around, life in Turkey is more affordable than most of the countries. Uh, you can meet your needs, such as your accommodation, food, drink, and entertainment with a very affordable price. Uh, you can stay at the dormitories, uh, which are near to your universities. You can easily rent a house for a very reasonable lease or rent. In addition, especially uh, when it comes to transportation, you have very easy access to transportation. 
of course, you would also like to spend some time out. Uh, so as a student, you get a lot of discounts. Uh, even while going to a cinema, you also get a good discount on specific days being a student. And that applies to your transportation as well. So whichever way you may choose to discover Turkey, all right, uh, it, there are you know, there are countless attractions uh, and you can really uh, make your life very comfortable here. And I'm very confidently saying that because, as I said, based on the experience that I have and the, I mean, the amount of travel that I've done, I can assure you that you would not be having any such difficulty. Of course, uh, if you're in Turkey, uh, I must say that uh, it's a great opportunity for you to learn Turkish. I myself, I'm in the process of learning Turkish. There are several programs in the universities in Turkey that are in English. And besides, as I said, we can also learn Turkish for the reason because it's the fifth most spoken language in the world. So you can get a chance to learn a new language uh, in your Turkish courses that the universities do offer. And it will offer you to understand the culture, the structure of the society, and, on the, and, and apart from that, make more friends and know more people. And that would actually make you well more versed with the world that is around you. So this was a very brief uh, introduction to Turkey and why one needs to think of studying in Turkey. Now, the most important question uh, that you need to ask yourself is, or what you might be having in your mind is that why Istanbul Medipol University? Well, uh, I'll be very honest to you. It's not something that I'm apple polishing or I'm trying to give you any, uh, you know, bias opinion. But frankly, uh, as I said, with my 20 years of experience up and down, I can assure you that uh, it is one of the best choices that you can make. And I'll, and I'll explain you why, because you need to know why you as a student should choose Istanbul Metropolitan University. So I'll, I'll break it down in very simple, uh, in simple points so you can remember them. And on the other hand, if there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer you. So as I was saying, I mean, if you ask me that why, you, you as a student, should you uh, choose Istanbul Medipol University? But then let me explain you a few things. See, Medipol University is, I'm very confidently saying this, uh, that it is one of the best universities that are there in Turkey. That's one. And there's no doubt that it is also one of the top universities in Europe. The university utilizes the latest technologies to serve its students and to encourage them to reach to the highest level in education. And they provide the training that is exactly required for the real world. So that's the main key point. On the other hand, I would like to clarify, and maybe you might already be knowing about it, that as far as my DePaul University is concerned, we have two campuses. One is in Kavacik in the Asian side and the other one is in the European side, which is called Kilic. Yes. So they both, all these campuses, they are very well equipped. They have large classrooms. They have the latest visual and audio equipment, which is available. We have all the sports facilities that you can ask for, entertainment areas for students. And on top of that, we have around more than 50 student clubs beside of the cinema, theater, and the photography studios. So as far as the uh, Halic campus is concerned, which is located on the European side of Istanbul, it basically includes uh, uh, medicine and dentistry and the Kavaja campus, uh, which is situated on the Asian side of the Istanbul, uh, those uh, that campus basically includes uh, faculties of pharmacy, health sciences, engineering, social science, business, and even arts. And uh, literature. So my point of argument over here is that Medipol University is, as I said, is one of the top leading universities in Turkey. Right? And of course, it, its major role has been related with health. All right. And in context to that, the Medipol Mega University Hospital is considered as one of the largest health projects in Turkey. 
and it has many departments and medical specializations it also gives students like you know exceptional opportunities for practical and professional trainings so these are some of the basics that you need to understand but keeping that in mind let me clarify that all of this falls under one very simple vision and that is that we at medipol we intend and we aim to become a leading university globally that can provide scientific results to contribute to the social development social development of people society and the world and of course our mission is that we would we aim to graduate students who can provide new technology and sciences as well as to those who can respond to social demands and can take the responsibility of developing the society in a much more sustainable and a much more appropriate manner so as i said there are there are number of reasons why you should consider medipol and not to forget this was just about the facilities the best faculty you can see right now by going on the website and you can look at it you have we have one of the finest most renowned and well experienced faculty members with not only practical knowledge but also with very sound academic backgrounds and this is what is the key for any student to look upon when he or she is planning or thinking to induct or join any university so as i said why medipol university of course because the university provides state of the art facility that can assist you to develop your skills develop your knowledge base and provide you with the resource that can make you move further and on top of that it's about it's all about the faculty people all right your professors your teachers who are there to assist you who can groom you and who are grooming at the moment to make you one of the finest individuals who can actually contribute once they graduate all right not only to the society of course which is a very key important role but also do tremendously well in their own respective careers and areas so as i said uh there there's a lot that the the medipol as a university offers and the, if with the i mean if we look at it it's a complete package that you can think of all right as i said you have all uh, other related uh, activities student activities that you can indulge yourself in or uh, like as i said sports uh, debates on the other hand other group clubs that you have and on the other hand yes as far as the quality and standard of education is concerned it is no less than any other university in the world in fact it is as good as top tier universities of the world so the next question that you should be asking is that why you need to choose business department because i am from the business department and that is something that you should really ask well uh, let me give you a little bit of a brief introduction because i think uh, Uh, we started off very quickly and knowing that there's a time limitation as i said i have a phd in business but apart from that uh, my first degree is in computer engineering and i after completing my computer engineering i did an mba in finance from pakistan because i am from pakistan and with the international industrial experience that i have for almost like 10 years along with the governmental experience i must say that if you really want to you know do well of, of course i mean you have to work hard yourself but then again the role of the university is very critical in terms of grooming you and bringing you to a point where you can really make a difference and i must say that especially business schools and i mean not i mean post covid or pre covid it's basically the same in fact now we have more responsibilities because of the current circumstances so my my point of argument is that you know business schools they play a very critical role in terms of making the right business intellects so what exactly do you need to know about the business department and of istanbul medipol university 
Well, in very simple terms, let me clarify that the Medipol Business School, as I said, is no less than any business school that is there. All right. In fact, it is very well structured. It has highly competent faculty. And on top of that, the courses that are being offered are state of the art, which are the need of time. Need of time means that we are training our students to have the best that is there available, keeping in mind the overall requirements of the industry. So the Medipal Business School, yes, the main objective is excellence in undergraduate and graduate education. And that too, that would develop successful prospective business leaders who will not only make a difference in the academic world, let me clear you on that, but who will actually make a lot of difference in the real world, in the actual business world. And that's one of the reasons why we at Istanbul Medipal Business School, we aim to provide every single student of ours and the community with a high value to distinguishing teaching and learning methodologies and courses that are supported by significant intellectual and professional involvement. So as what our motto goes with, that there is, that nothing is more crucial than what comes about in our classrooms. And we pay very extra attention to the quality of education that we offer to our students. And I assure you, we are as good as any Ivy League university you can think of. I mean, I'm not exaggerating, but this is the reality because the amount of efforts, the hard work, the the involvement that the faculty is putting in, especially in grooming our business students, is no doubt worth, you know, it's, it's worth applauding. So, of course, we have within the business department, we have sub departments in which we are making our students specialize, specialize in a way that they can actually meet the market requirements. For instance, I come from the business administration department. All right. We have economics and finance, which is again, a very highly reputed and very well, uh, you know, it's, it's well decorated with some of the finest names in Turkey when it comes to, you know, experts of economics and finance. Similarly, we have another department within the business school, uh, I mean, within the main business department that is international trade and finance. We have international logistics and management. We have human resource management. We have banking and insurance management information systems. So ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to make my point here is that Medipol Business School offers the best courses that are available for you to be well equipped and actually meet market and industrial demands. And the teaching and the learning methodology is state of the art and it's very updated. And only because of this, you can cross verify, you can check on the internet and you can check on the Illuminis that we have that our students are doing exceptionally well once they have graduated. So the next thing that you can think is, what is the quality of academic staff, all right? I have indirectly pointed out in my discussion but then again, I'll again clarify that as far as the faculty members are concerned and those who are coming to Medipol, I assure you that they're coming from scholarly and practice oriented research areas. They are the, I mean, you can find, as I said, some of the finest minds and names of Turkey who are very reputed economists working for in our department with us. You can find authors of books that are well reputed and well read. And we have, of course, colleagues who are very, very renowned researchers and they have papers and articles which have been published in the top leading journals in the world, especially in the field of business and finance. And yes, with all of this, we all follow a teaching methodology which is suitable to digital natives, all right? So sticking with the problem solving approach, that is what makes us go further. And let me assure you that our curriculum or the course content that we have, it includes 
a very, very massive, you know, I mean, we have a very massive commitment towards community involvement projects. And let, I, I would also like to clarify over here that it is the school's dedication to long, uh, you could say lifelong learning and self-improvement initiative that we have taken. So we offer, as I said, we do offer double majors and there are a number of my students who are actually doing that. And it's only to basically give you more and more strength so once you graduate and you go to the industry, you can be more well-versed and can be more acceptable in the practical. So our business school, it well exploits the advantages which are there in Istanbul because Istanbul is a financial hub and it's also the industrial heart of Turkey. And how do we do it? We do it by inviting the top level management members of different organizations to our classrooms and they give presentations, seminars, and we conduct workshops to ensure that our students meet the overall demands and requirements of the industry. And that's the key, key element that we focus on in order for you to be more compatible and more, you know, competitive once you go in the market. So, Keeping this in mind, the next question that you need to ask is, as I said, I've already covered it indirectly in my discussion, but I'll again clarify that the last thing that you need to ask is, what does the business department offers its students? As I said, the business department offers, you know, highly competent faculty. Number one, they, they basically offer, one, I mean, the latest tools and, you know, teaching techniques, I mean, teaching material, and on the other hand, the latest cases that can help you flourish and can make you understand the nuts and bolts of how the business world works. One thing that you need to keep in mind is that, of course, uh, based on this COVID-19 that we are going through, and these are some difficult times, but hopefully things are getting better, things are getting in control, and we are very hopeful that we will find a cure for this very soon. But since the beginning of this pandemic and even at the present state, we as a business department, we have actually realized and we have already worked on the fact that how the business environment in the world has changed and is changing and what needs to be done in terms of making our students much well versed with the overall changes in the environment so they can become more and more acceptable and, you know, uh, acceptable by the real so yes, we are very up to date. As I said, we have, a, we have the best faculty that is there for you to groom you well and to prepare you for the future that lies ahead. So this was a very small and a very brief uh, overview of you joining Istanbul Medipol University and we trying to provide you with the best that there is for you to have a much more successful life ahead. I thank you very much once again for providing me the opportunity and letting me speak to you. If there are any questions, any queries, please feel free to ask me. I'm open for your questions and answers. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am, is there anything that you would like to and no, thank you. When you leave the meeting, it's going to uh, record it. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a nice day. You too. About 71 undergraduate programs in 13 schools and 24 of these programs are in English, so the medium of instruction is English, which you can you which you can attend easily. And the programs and the faculties include International School of Medicine, Dentistry, Medicine, Pharmacy, Health Sciences, Engineering and Natural Sciences, to Educational Faculty and College of Health Sciences. So Long story short, we are a very big family. 
So for any international student, Turkey has a lot to offer. It has a high quality education opportunities and it has a very multicultural population. So it is very normal to encounter with a student or with a person from very diverse backgrounds in every step around Istanbul. And it has very lively cities and beautiful landscapes with artistic and cultural and sportive events and so on. So there are some things to know before coming to Turkey, right? So there are three biggest cities in here. We will come to Istanbul in a few minutes. Let me talk about Izmir and Ankara. Izmir is a seaside country, uh, is a seaside city with um, holiday resorts and all. And Ankara is the capital city of Turkey. In Ankara, the Tur Turkey Republic was founded. So Istanbul has 15 million residents and it is the most populous city in Turkey. Although it's not being the capital, it, we can say that it is the capital in terms of economy, culture, and history. Because it's a transcontinental city, it connects two continents, the Europe and Asia. It had been the capital of Byzantine and Ottoman empires. It gained, um, gained it some historical and cultural value with its strategic position as a junction point between old trade routes. And as for you, Istanbul is a wonderful choice for international students like you. And there are a wide range of opportunities for food, entertainment, cultural activities, as well as nightlife. And it's very normal to encounter with a live event happening at your every step around Istanbul. And I have a tip for you guys. Search for Istanbul Vlux shot by tourists or international students on YouTube. As a matter of fact, let me show you a very brief video regarding Istanbul. That was a mesmerizing video clip prepared by Turkish Airlines. And let's move on to our presentation. And let me show you some basic Turkish words that you will need when you land to Istanbul, Turkey. And for yes, we say evet. For no, we say hayır. 
For thank you, we say teşekkürler. And there are some cognate words. For example, toilet is tuvalet. Train is tren. Cinema is cinema. And let me count you from one to ten in Turkish. Bir, iki, üç, dört, beş, altı, yedi, sekiz, dokuz, on. And I have a tip for you guys here. Please download a translation application on your phone and make sure that you use it when you come to here because you will need it. And there are some misconceptions about Turkish culture and maybe you have encountered them on the Hollywood sector, but camel riding is not a way of transportation for Turkish people. However, in some touristic places, you can test drive camel riding. And the capital of Turkey is Ankara, not Istanbul, contrast to what many people think. And I am very proud to say that Turkey is the first country that has ever, ever given the right to rights to women to vote and to be elected locally and nationwide. And even before Switzerland, the center of civilization. And Papa Nail had lived in Turkey but Turkish people do not celebrate now, but only they celebrate the new year. Of course, Turkish people with Christian origins do celebrate Noel. And I have a tip for you guys here. Please refrain from stereotyping, but you can always ask questions about your friend's culture. And in Turkey, family means a lot to us. In Bayram's, the younger ones, kiss the elderly people's hand and a money or candy is given in return. That's a good way to save enough money if you're a kid in Turkey. And Turkish people are highly hospitable and friendly. And do not be surprised if the person you talk on the street invites you for a tea. And I have a tip for you guys here. Please watch some Turkish TV series to develop your communication skills as well as your understanding of way of Turkish life. And I have a clip for you here about hospitality and food. This French international student was given a lot of food throughout the day and at the end of it, he was sickened by it and he was hospitalized. It's, it's a funny video to watch, but please be careful about what you eat throughout the day in Turkey. And Turkish coffee is one of the irresplaceable habits of Turkish people. And it is generally served with a Turkish delight. And moreover, we can tell the drinker's fortune by looking at the marks at the coffee ground's leaf. And there's even an app for this. You scan the marks on the coffee grounds and you send it to the program and your uh, commentary comes to your phone in a few minutes. And even though Turkish coffee is very common, a, tur a research study shows that a regular Turkish citizen drinks about five times. What is it? Of course, the Turkish tea. And it is mostly preferred during the breakfast or after the dinner. However, you can be served Turkish tea throughout the, throughout the day in every case. And my tip for you is that please visit traditional caves and immerse yourself in the Turkish culture because you can always find cream whipped frappuccino all around the world, but not Turkish tea and Turkish coffee. 
and there are some great places to travel in Istanbul. For example, Hagia Sophia. Another one is Topkapı Palace, where the Ottoman Empire was ruled from. So let's come to the cost of living in Turkey. You can take a screenshot of this page to later use. For example, a regular milk for one liter costs around 2.61 Turkish dirhams, whereas apple for one kilogram costs about three Turkish dirhams. And uh, a white bread, for example, is about one and a half Turkish dirhams. And one way ticket in the city center from some place to another costs about 2.45 Turkish dirhams. However, when your semester starts, you will be given a discounted student card, which the price will be a lot lower. And for example, a cinema ticket for one seat is 16 to 20 liras. And I have a tip for you guys here please visit numbeo.com to get all the details about prices. And let me show you prices in Istanbul. You go to that city, you, you click on here and you write Istanbul, and then you can see the prices here. For example, milk, bread, rice, eggs, and banana. These prices are very updated and it will help you a lot. Okay, let's get back to the presentation. So another thing is accommodation. When you come to Turkey or just before you come here, you need to rent a place, right? These are the words that you should know when you are looking for a rental place. And there are some websites I have put in here to help you finding a new house for you. However, I have a tip for you. If you go on Facebook and look for uh, roommates for international students, for Erasmus students, you can find a lot of opportunities for lower prices. However, you should be very careful uh, with whom you share your flat, right? And according to the Turkish law, a smartphone bought from abroad has to be registered. If you are a student or not, it doesn't matter. If you do not register your phone in 120 days, your phone will be close to communication in Turkey. You can register your phone for a price or you can buy a new phone here. But remember, phone prices are not very cheap in here. So we suggest you to register your phone. And my tip for you, please decide on your telecommunication provider company and your monthly plan before coming in here so that you won't have to spend hours in the uh, you know, telecommunication provider company. And as a student, you can have a discounted museum card with which you can visit all the museums all around the Turkey. And I suggest you to do that even before you come in here. And when the semester starts, of course, you will be able to get a discounted card. Okay, there are some um, options for traveling around Turkey, Turkey and there are some uh, price ranges here. Of course, these prices might change in a second. And in addition to airplane, bus and train, there are some car sharing applications on the Apple Store or Google Play Market. However, safety is first and please be aware of the potential dangers of it. And here are some emergency numbers that you can use during your stay. And as expected, most of the scam occur in Istanbul touristic areas such as Sultan Ahmet and Istiklal Avenue. And let me remind you that scams are not specific to any city or country. It's a global problem. And one of the most popular scams happening in Istanbul is that when you are walking on the street, someone approaches to you and they say, uh, let's go for a drink. And they become friends with you and you are naive to do so. And then you go to a restaurant or a place, you order drinks and meals and everything. And, but the thing that you don't know is that the person that you have just met 
is a friend of the restaurant owner. And in a few minutes, you will be given a very extraordinary expensive bill and then you have to pay it. And if you don't, they threaten you. And of course, there's pickpocketing here as well as all around the world. And please be careful about it. And another thing to be worried about is taxis. And behave like you know the road, open up your GPS and yeah, it's like 15 minutes from here. Act like it, it will help you. However, I suggest you to download a taxi application, for example, B Taxi or Istanbul Taxi. When you click on the send taxi button, a taxi comes to you and you get on it and you'll go to the places that you like with a very fair price, all legal, no problem whatsoever. And transportation pass is very important for you guys. And when the semester starts, there will be some boots in the university and you will be given discounted students transportation card. However, as soon as you land in Istanbul airport, there will be some um, kiosks or machines, all right? You need to pay like 20, 20 Turkish dirhams or 30 Turkish dirhams to get the card. And I, I strongly suggest you to do it because it will help you a lot when you are trying to get to city center from Istanbul airport. And thanks for attending this seminar and we will be waiting for you in Istanbul Medipol University. And if you want to check out our website, Instagram and YouTube pages, here are the links. And if you want to download this presentation, please scan the QR code below on your default camera application or simply go to the link here. Thank you. So hi to everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about being a pharmacist, having a pharmacy education in the new normal and where are we evolving, okay? My name is uh, Martin Beck. I'm a lecturer, actually, a professor and doctor at Istanbul Medical University School of Pharmacy. And I'm very glad to meet with you all uh, for that speech. So first of all, let's start uh, with who am I? Uh, to get you a little bit more about me. I was born in Ankara, Turkey. Uh, actually, I'm basically a Turkish separate family origin. This is quite important because I have uh, uh, both uh, working opportunities for the uh, border, the Turkish borders and at the same time Cyprus borders. I have my Bachelor of Science degree in pharmacy uh, Afterwards, I did my master's and PhD in medicinal chemistry, which is also related to the pharmacy. And I have been a pharmacist for more than 20 years. Uh, up until now, I have worked for five different universities. Uh, I have some experiences for the National Institutes of Health, United States of America, and at the same time, University of Toronto at Canada. Uh, I did work as a general manager for a clinical research organization for, and at the same time a pharmaceutical development corporation for some time. And uh, I have some uh, uh, administrative liabilities for more than 15 years. Uh, in terms of defining myself, I generally, def first of all, define myself as a pharmacist, afterwards a researcher, lecturer, and afterwards a consultant. Okay, so that's basically who uh, am I. And the second thing you may be interested in is uh, why I choose to be a pharmacist. Uh, the first reason is to, I want to help people get well and stay well. The second thing is uh, I like to work directly with people. Uh, as I mentioned, I am a medicinal chemist, so uh, I like medicine, medicinal chemistry or chemistry biology working together. I like the links between them. Uh, and I'm excited to be, generally excited to be a major part of the innovation in the medication therapy. Uh, I like to work, uh, and I did want to work with the state uh, uh, of the art technology. Uh, 
Uh, for the work flexibilities, mobility uh, is important, stability is important, flexibility is uh, uh, important. And at the same time, I'm, I'm just very fond of enjoying wide variety of career opportunities. Okay. Uh, at the beginning, when I was 20s, uh, before uh, starting to make my uh, choice about the education, I, I like to be a highly respected member of my community. And uh, also, uh, a lot of people in my family is doctors, pharmacists, and at the same time, dentists. So I know the benefits uh, of being one of a, a health profession, and I, can, I know that I can benefit from the demand for the pharmacists. So basically, that's why I choose to be a pharmacist at the uh, beginning, okay? So uh, when you look at what pharmacists do, uh, uh, generally, in the society, people think that we are only giving what's prescribed, okay? So uh, basically, the prescriptions, doctor produced the pres uh, prescriptions, and afterwards, we, uh, uh, they thought that we are just preparing these prescriptions and uh, assist the uh, patients according to this. Uh, that's, that's the perceptions, okay? So uh, in a Canadian study, uh, about 3,251 patients, okay, uh, they ask what does the pharmacist do, okay? And uh, the results are quite uh, interesting because um, first of all, uh, they uh, mentioned that pharmacists are the ones who are basically best defining to how to take a medicine, okay? and giving out handouts uh, and tell them, tell them about the medicines, uh, tell them about the common side effects, checking drug interactions, uh, and uh, pharmacists are the ones uh, uh, the medicines are asked for, okay? And <clears throat> this is the first question, actually. The second one is how the pharmacist is uh, perceived, okay? They thought that, they think that the health information uh, they're talking about uh, with the pharmacists are remain confidential, okay? And they are comfortable talking with the pharmacists about their health. And they generally think that uh, uh, they are not the ones who are behind the counters, okay, only. And they are the ones who are advising them about their health, about their uh, uh, well-being, okay? And uh, are, when the patients ask if the pharmacists are healthcare professionals, they said that uh, I want my pharmacist and doctor to work together, okay? In order to be sure that I'm just taking the best treatments or receiving the best treatment, okay? And they all thought that uh, the pharmacists are health professionals, just like doctors and nurses, okay? And uh, whenever there is a problem with the medicines, pharmacists are the ones who have access to the medical information and able to tell uh, uh, if there is a problem or not, and at the same time, just giving advices uh, during the medication uses, okay? And the last uh, thing the uh, patients were asked was, uh, what more pharmacists must do? They thought that they have to advise uh, on the minor health problems, okay? They have to give uh, talks and seminars on the health conditions that's interested, uh, that interest the patient, okay? They have to uh, receive uh, home calls and ask how the new medicine is working or not, okay? Uh, and they want them to refill their medicine when the doctor is not available, okay? There's, there are other things that we can mention within that study. Uh, however, that's not the only study, okay? Uh, if you look at the literature uh, or the uh, perceptions of the patients, you can easily see that the same results come from many different countries, okay? So basically, people think that we are only retail pharmacists or in other words, community pharmacists, and we are just giving uh, pills, advising them, and just interacting uh, with their health problems, and also uh, try to advise them during the uh, sessions, okay? So uh, to sum up, uh, for the community pharmacists uh, or the pharmacies, uh, it's generally thought that the neighborhood pharmacy is the first step that you ask for all medical advices, okay? And uh, 
within different studies, uh, the society thinks that the pharmacists are the most reliable healthcare practitioners, okay? And they are the most easily reachable healthcare practitioners without having, uh, without having a, any appointment. Wherever you just get ill, you, you first just to uh, uh, admin to your uh, family health practitioner. However, it's not the case always, okay? Uh, you have to take appointments in order to uh, reach to your family practice uh, practice. However, uh, in the other words, the pharmacists are the most easy reachable healthcare practitioners without having an appointment. Okay, and uh, everybody knows that the neighborhood pharmacists are constantly monitoring, advising, and informing you about uh, your health conditions and at the same time your well-being. Okay, so basically, we are the most trustable healthcare pro uh, professionals or practitioners uh, that you can reach without having any kind of appointment, which is actually very important, okay? And we are the ones who are constantly monitoring and advising and informing you about your health and uh, thinking about your uh, well-being, okay? So uh, is being a community pharmacist uh, the only option? Actually not. Uh, from the patient side, generally, as they see that we are the uh, ones who are just giving or filling their prescriptions. Uh, we don't think like that, okay? Uh, there are other fields that a pharmacist can work, such as hospital and clinical pharmacies. We have some specialized fields, such as uh, geriat being a geriatric uh, pharmacist, sports pharmacist, complementary and alternative medicine pharmacist, psychiatric pharmacist, nuclear pharmacist, infectious disease pharmacist, they're all specialized. Uh, forms of pharmacists and they're all working in different locations in hospital in clinical pharmacy or in, or in different settings okay such as in sports clubs uh, such as in uh, ambulatory care facilities and so on and we have another field called industrial pharmacy okay uh, this field is actually uh, dealing with the development regulatory issues manufacturing quality controls and sales uh, of the uh, pharmaceutical products and at the same time uh, related pharmaceutical uh, uh, productions and the other things, okay? Uh, we can work as government pharmacists uh, that's uh, generally dealing with the, all aspects of the drug leg legislation, reimbursement and regulatory issues. issues. Uh, uh, like me, uh, you can be an academic uh, and make research and development, consult to the may, many of the industrial pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical companies or lecture in different uh, areas, okay? Or uh, compounding pharmacists, which or managed care pharmacies, and there, there are many, many more. The most uh, interesting one or the most extreme one is being a space pharmacist, okay? There's a group of people uh, working for the NASA and uh, they're just preparing the drugs for the astronauts and they're just making some studies over how the medicines act in space actually. And uh, they're interested in uh, how the human uh, metabolism or human body change with the drugs within space conditions. So most, expre uh, most uh, extreme of them is, the, is being a space pharmacist and there are some, okay. As you know, uh, for more than six months, the world is having a new, different crisis, it's, and uh, it's COVID-19, okay? And we have a new normal, and generally we are separated from each other, okay? Uh, isolated uh, from the community, and uh, every area, every industrial area is actually uh, stopped, or social area is stopped during that uh, disease, okay? Such as the football games, such as the film industry, such as the uh, uh, travel industry, or uh, such as the hotels and everywhere, okay? And during that new normal, uh, all of the health facilities uh, stopped for a while, okay? Uh, just giving only the medication and treatments for the COVID-19, okay? But nothing else, okay? Uh, all the clinics, all the family practices, or uh, everywhere dealing with the general health issues were closed, okay? Uh, the only ones who are giving uh, 
uh, who are giving the main uh, service is uh, the pharmacies, okay? Not the uh, other ones, okay? So the, the education has stopped or isolated, okay? The, as you see, all the uh, graduations was stopped, okay? And we have different kinds of online or that kind of uh, graduation ceremonies. So basically everything was stopped, okay? Uh, so all the industries are interrupted except three industries. The first one is the uh, food supply chain, okay? Or in other words, groceries, okay? They didn't stop, they have to work in order to uh, give a uh, service to the, or feed the uh, big population, okay? The second places that, uh, the second industry that doesn't interrupt it was the pharmaceutical industry or the pharmacies. We uh, constantly uh, give services around to the uh, population, okay? Uh, and uh, we're not interrupted, we, we didn't interrupt our services. And uh, generally, they are the first line uh, advice taking, okay? Uh, prescription filling and uh, emergency, they turned out to be the first uh, emergency points, okay? And the third section, which is not interrupted, was the uh, digital uh, companies, okay? Uh, the internet became very important. Uh, so basically, COVID-19 produced the digital transformation for many uh, different areas, for many different work areas. And uh, so these three of the main industries are not interrupted, okay? Which is quite important. So uh, when we are beginning to return to the new normal, uh, today we know that there is a massive and growing investment to the health and pharma uh, from the governmental and private sectors, okay? And there are really a great amount of investments uh, for research for the vaccine and small drug molecules not only for this virus treatment, but at the same time, as you know, this virus turns out to be a, a bioterrorism uh, tool, okay? It can be a bioterrorism tool. So uh, in order to pre prevent the bioterrorism, and uh, people are just uh, investing or the, the financials are starting to invest to keep people healthy before being ill. And they are starting to think about their uh, well-being more, or investing on their well-being more. Okay, and at the same time, uh, the the more investments to keep food stocks more healthy, such as the agricultural and animal health and the drugs, which is actually very important. All of them in all of these uh, investment areas, pharmacists have some roles. Okay, as I explained previously, and uh, the health services are just started to be turning out to be a telemedicine or telehealth, okay? And during the uh, COVID-19 periods, uh, the health issues or the treatments are more personalized. And uh, because everybody's taking a bunch of medicines and these all of these medicines are interacting to each other, and whenever a patient is just uh, admitting to uh, the COVID-19 clinic, uh, they're using other drugs and the specialized doctors, doctors are not very specialized on uh, each of these different types of groups. So the uh, pharmacists are uh, needed more for the more personalized approach, okay? So today we need to see uh, the big picture. Uh, we have to be a global clicker and at the same time, we need to use uh, and know more technology and we need to use uh, more digital tools in order to survive or in order to adapt to the new normal, okay? So how about tomorrow? The tomorrow is uh, very interesting, actually, uh, because uh, if you look at uh, the uh, scenarios or the tomorrow of scenes, you can easily see that many healthcare devices just entering to the uh, health uh, field, which is basically uh, technological products or digitalized products, okay? Such as smart mirrors, 
uh, or the smart cameras or smart uh, breath detecting uh, devices that can give uh, actual medications or uh, define the illnesses, okay? Uh, lots of home healthcare bots are just uh, produced and they're just testing and working very well, okay? To give you the uh, necessary health needs within the health and uh, within the home environment, okay? So uh, for the disabled ones, actually the exoskeletons uh, are just produced and they're extended to their ability to perform the manual labors, okay? Uh, we are re actually using right now the smartphones uh, for uh, just like the home health diagnostic tools, such as uh, yeah, monitoring the heartbeats or the uh, temperature. How, uh, however, in the uh, coming days, they will be also tracking the urinary tract infections or diabetic eye diseases or such kind of things, okay? We have right now ingestible origami robots, uh, which can, uh, after swallowed, can control uh, the uh, can control a, a wound to to to, to close the, uh, can control the wound and at the same time close the or patch the wound. Okay, and uh, there are also food as medicine approach. Okay, and there are some special microorganisms were produced uh, in order to just. Uh, detect the glucose levels and improve overall health. Also more wearable technologies, more uh, artificial intelligence and more digital uh, scenarios, okay? For the future scenarios, uh, actually uh, treatments will be focused on personal chemical and biological solutions, uh, focused on digital therapeutics, uh, nutraceuticals, implants, genes and things. Or programmable bacteria that can uh, serve as a clinical researchers. Okay, such as if you look at this bacteria for uh, anti-tumor immunity, it's actually uh, in the market right now. There, there are some uh, studies right now. Okay, and 3D printing of the drugs or uh, consolidated health destinations in retail pharmacies. Telehealth services, uh, same day uh, delivery by uh, the drones or the driverless cars is very popular. Okay, actually, uh, even it's even if I said that it's a future scenario uh, in the COVID periods, uh, they all uh, were processed. Okay, automation and artificial intelligence alg algorithms uh, are really important. So if you look at the virtual reality pharmacies here, we will we'll be facing with them within the coming future. Okay. And computer-aided drug design, we are also doing for some time. And uh, however, it will be more important to get reached to the destination of developing new drugs, developing new therapies. And of course, the internet of the things will become very important uh, for the real-time diagnosis and insights of the uh, patients or the health uh, healthcare receivers, okay? So let's look at a scenario about uh, a SEM stroke, okay? Think that we have a, a character, it's called a SEM, okay? And while using, in the near future, while using his smart toothbrush, uh, first signs of uh, 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 some kind of throat infection will be detected by the uh, toothbrush, okay? And digitally, uh, a bacterial sample is took from uh, and afterwards diagnosed within seconds, okay, by the help of the uh, toothbrush, only, okay. And afterwards, uh, first the uh, SEMS toothbrush informed the kettle in the kitchen, okay, and produces a very mild uh, natural tea uh, and starts to uh, produce the to produce this tea for the relief of the uh, throat, okay? Afterwards, uh, triggers a series of uh, information sending and receiving uh, processes throughout the internet and asks uh, how the bacteria will be uh, treated uh, or which kind of medicine is effective on, this, on the treatment of the bacteria. And afterwards, the 3D peels 
are will be printed, and the drones sent the pills uh, to home, and the amount will be deducted from the uh, Sam's bank account uh, by the use of uh, the uh, avatar he is using. Okay, and uh, after Sam is just uh, has chased, has taken the drug and feels himself better, uh, this avatar follows up. Uh, the conditions, okay, and uh, afterwards gives information about the SEMS condition to the uh, health practitioner, the pharmacists, uh, or the health system. So, so bottom line is something like that. We need more educated, uh, more technology-driven, more equipped, more patient and research-oriented pharmacists within the coming days, okay. Uh, we're not only giving uh, prescriptions, we have to follow uh, all of these things within the uh, near future, okay? So uh, let's have a look at our education at Istanbul Medical University School of Pharmacy. We have a two-year pre-med program, uh, similar in all, all health-related sciences. It's, it's, just, it's, it's just an introductory uh, courses, a bunch of introductory courses and at the same time professional related lectures, okay? And in the third and fourth years, we are giving our students a profession science, so-called profession science lectures, okay? Uh, which we are, uh, which actually uh, designed uh, as unique professions, okay? Uh, the pharmacy or unique sides of the pharmacy professions, okay, such as medicine, chemistry, toxicology, pharmacology, clinical pharmacy, and so forth. Okay, uh, what we are aiming with these lectures in the third and fourth years is to uh, classically uh, create a science-based type pharmacist. Okay, and by that time, we are trying to give our students the core of our profession. Uh, where and how they would find the updated knowledge, literature, and use them, okay? And uh, we're just uh, encouraging them to do some researches and some production with us, okay? So basically, these uh, third and fourth uh, classes, fourth year classes, are just served as a grand tour of our profession, okay? <clears throat> Also, we have some mandatory and voluntary internship programs, uh, both in retail, academic, hospital uh, pharmacies, okay? And as well as the uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, the uh, main thing that we are doing here with these uh, internship programs is to uh, prepare our young colleagues to make their minds for the future without being a real player. And uh, we offer our students some exchange programs, uh, flexible curriculum that can be fit uh, afterwards when they go to some kind of exchange program, taking some lessons or courses, and when they return, we have a flexible uh, curriculum that can uh, uh, that we can fit their classes that they are taking. Okay, and also we have some uh, bilateral agreements with various universities. Okay. For the last year, the last uh, year is uh, generally designed with the elective courses and internships. And these internships and elective courses are uh, basically uh, within four different tracks, the hospital uh, or clinical, academic, industry, and community or retail pharmacies. Okay? And we want every student to at least follow two different tracks. Uh, in case they change their minds. And all of these tracks are actually enriched with the management and social sciences lectures, because we think that the management and social sciences is very important uh, to uh, transform uh, our young colleague or candidate to be a socially uh, very well interacted uh, or community very well interacted or oriented pharmacist. So even if you have, uh, you, you will be a researcher, you will be a community pharmacist, or you will be working in an industrial uh, type of uh, setting, you need to have uh, great management and social skills. So we are just offering these things uh, at the same time. Uh, we have great hospitals, we have great, uh, Actually, we have great laboratories, we have great hospitals that, are, uh, that we are using uh, during our uh, 
uh, studies and internships. So uh, our every student can be uh, can have benefit from the use of them. Okay. So another thing that I, I just want you to talk uh, is uh, the future of our education. So what will happen afterwards to the pharmacy education or in general, the education? Sure that we will uh, have more online lectures. Okay? Actually, we did a whole period uh, last semester, but we will have some more online lectures. Uh, we're just thinking that the exams is not the way uh, to uh, just measure the student levels or our colleagues levels. So basically we're just uh, turning our focuses to more project-based development. Uh, we are just working over more flexible schedules. Uh, we are trying to uh, transform our uh, laboratories and internships partly to, to, to the digital uh, area, okay? Uh, in case this uh, epidemic still goes on. And uh, we're just uh, uh, having uh, whole online drug design development simulations. Uh, we, are also, uh, we also have some virtual reality applications or virtual real life simulations. Uh, we'll be just uh, increasing the number of them during our educations. We are trying to change our education to a more game and decision-making based approach. And we are just trying to transform our education to a more self-driven education instead of a class education. Because we know that the class education is very important. However, you're just receiving some kind of packs that uh, and sometimes it will be memorized and afterwards uh, get lost from the mind. So basically self-driven education gives more uh, insight and more strong basement to, the, to your education. And we are uh, constantly working on giving educations over more speci specialized fields. Uh, and uh, we are constantly working on making our campus more comfortable, more affo affordable, uh, of course, try to give our students excellent amenities, housekeeping, security, and recreational facilities. So basically, all of them will be more during the near future for the education. So what will not change is actually another question. Uh, what will not change in the future is the importance and the role of the pharmacists and in every drug-related field. Uh, of course, our education standards will not uh, change. Okay. We have high uh, education standards and we are trying to make them better with the accreditations uh, and so forth. Okay. And uh, we are always think that the students are not students. Actually, we are not treating our students as, uh, as students. We are treating them as young colleagues from the family. And uh, therefore, we want them to to become uh, successful pharmacists, okay? And at the same time, we want them to have great campus and education experience, and we want, to, uh, uh, we want them to have a health work and life balance. So that's the basic thing that we are mainly concerned. So if you uh, think that you will just receive these things in the Medipol, uh, in Turkey, Medipol University is one of the best places that you can uh, receive this, these uh, kind of treatment and education. So if you're interested in the uh, further uh, application processes and everything, you can reach uh, to us from our website, which is actually here. And uh, I really want you to, I want, I really want to thank you for listening to me for a short while and wish you the uh, best of best during your whole lives. If you want to reach me uh, on, on any question regarding the School of Pharmacy or best or uh, on our education, you can mail me at the same time. So uh, thank you for listening to me and uh, take care of yourselves. Okay, uh, my name is Hakan Doğan. I'm an associate professor uh, in the electrical engineering department of uh, Istanbul Medipol University. So I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna briefly talk about the past and the future of electronics uh, in this lecture. 
uh, I will briefly talk about, let's briefly talk about where it started, okay? And quickly, let's talk about it, but we will mostly focus on the uh, last 50 years or so. Okay, the first modern signalization and telegraph uh, was the first done in 1844 by uh, Morse. Uh, that was the, basically the beginning of telegraph. And then they founded a company, West, Western Union Telegraph, uh, based on this. And in this technology, basically, they were able to send uh, information using a device like this through wires basically by connecting and disconnecting uh, this device to the, 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 the two poles, basically, you, you are able to generate noises, uh, short or long deep noises, basically. And amazingly, this was used for a long time. So it was used from 1861 to 2000, almost 2000, okay? Even in the modern communication age, uh, this uh, communication system was used basically. So the the second, uh, maybe the second most important, or uh, this is as important as the first one, but uh, a second very important communication method was the phone call basically. And in 1876, Graham Bell was able to call uh, one of his assistants from one room to another room in the same house. And he said, basically, Mr. Watson, come here. I need to see you. And Mr. Watson was able to hear this. And they patented this uh, technology. And this uh, here, you can see the patent, actually. Uh, the first long distance phone call, long, long distance meaning uh, from one city to another city. I mean, they're not too far away, but it was ten, August 10th, 1876, uh, between Brantford, Ontario and P Paris, Ontario. So it was a 16 kilometer distance. And this was the first phone call basically between two uh, individuals in a long distance. So this is kind of the beginning. If we fast forward now, okay, uh, now we do pretty much all the electronics with transistors, okay? So first, uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, why like every year or every other year, the, the, the new electronics, the new gadgets that we see are much more complicated than the previous year, basically, okay? So this started in around 1960s, okay? Uh, with the, even before that, with the invention, invention of transistors, okay? Uh, there, is, there is a very well-known uh, law, okay? Moore's law. And Moore is basically, one of the founders of Intel Corporation, okay? The Intel that makes the computer uh, microprocessors, okay? He was one of the uh, founders and Moore came up with a rule, okay? A very successful uh, guess, okay? He guessed that, uh, well, this is an educa educated guess, okay? It's, it's not a random guess. So he, force, he foresees that, he foresees that every 1.5 years or two years, there's going to be two times transistors on a single die, okay? So this way, I mean, if I have a, a processor with 1,000 transistors on it, next year it's going to be 2,000, next year it's going to be 4,000. So this is an exponential growth, okay? And... Uh, his prediction actually holds true. When we look at the data, okay, we see a linear increase, okay? So uh, this is a log scale, of course, okay? Uh, with respect to log scale, the uh, number of transistors on a single die, okay? So these are different chips uh, represented here, microprocessors, memories, and other solutions, okay? 
So it's a, in the logarithmic scale, it's a linear increase, which means that he guessed it right, basically, okay? So why is this important? It's important because it gives you, it gives you an idea what you can do next year or what you can do in five years down the road, what you can do in 10 years down the road, okay? So this is a very enabling uh, guess, okay? So this way, people can plan what they're gonna do in five years, basically, because they know what the technology is gonna be, so they can prepare for that. Okay, so, Moore's law, with Moore's law, uh, in our life, we see this every day, right? I mean, uh, if you look at your life, basically, five years ago, 10 years ago, you see the progress of electronics. For example, we have a, a picture here. Uh, Osborne Executor, the big computer here, was the first mobile computer. It was done in 1982. It has a four megahertz CPU, okay? And right next to it, we have an Apple iPhone, the first uh, Apple iPhone, I guess, 2007. It has a 412 megahertz CPU. Uh, the executive, the mobile computer or laptop, if you wanna call that, uh, is 100 times heavier, 500 times larger, and 10 times uh, more expensive, okay? So basically in 25 years, uh, the electronics was able to go from this mobile, huge mobile computer to an iPhone, which is 100 times faster or uh, 100 times faster, but you can hold it in your hand basically. So this is the power of Moore's law. There is another law, okay, this is related to computers, okay, the first one was more related to chip production and chip design. This is related to computers. Uh, this is Bell's law, and this predicts that every 10 years there's a new computer class. So meaning that if you start from mainframes, mainframe is a huge computer that was built maybe 50, 60 years ago, I mean, the computer, the whole computer is inside a huge room, basically, okay? You can see it here, people uh, sitting in front of the computer, and uh, I don't have the specs, but if you look at it, if you have the specs, that's going to be, the, most probably that has less uh, processing power than your watch, for example, okay? Your Apple Watch or another watch basically may have more processing power. This computer that's basically inside a huge room basically. And if you, if you move down, okay, you go from mainframes to mini computers to workstations, okay, then we have PCs. Uh, I kind of lead the workstation and PC era. <laughs> Right. So we moved from laptops to tablets and uh, phones, basically, uh, smartphones. Now, your tablet or your smartphone is your interface. Hocam, sesiniz biraz cızırtı oldu. Uh, şu anda düzeldi ama. Okay. So. Uh, your phone, your tablet or your phone is your interface to a huge processing power, which we call it cloud now, cloud computing, right? Using your phone or tablet, you can connect to the cloud and do whatever you want, okay? All the processing power you need is in the cloud and you just need to need an interface, basically a gateway to reach that and your phone or your tablet is that gateway basically, okay? So now that's where we are basically. Okay, so if you look at the first general purpose computer, we talked about mainframes here. Mainframes used 
uh, vacuum tubes, not transistors, but vacuum tubes, okay? So these are, I mean, all technology basically, as you can see, these are tubes uh, in vacuum basically, vac vacuum tubes, and they act like uh, amplifiers, okay? Or on-off switches, okay? The technology makes them uh, to act like on-off switches, which you can use to generate ones and zeros, basically. So using vacuum tubes, they, they uh, built this computer here, which is uh, 30 meter by 2.4 meter by one meter dimensions, and it weighs 27 tons, basically, okay? So that's basically the, uh, the granddad or grandfather of our current computers or uh, uh, tablets, basically. Okay, let's move forward 100 years later from vacuum tubes. Now we came to transistors, okay? So this is human hair, okay? And human hair is about 80 micrometers, okay? And on the right-hand side, we have the, one of the most modern technologies, okay? This is uh, one of the most recent technologies, 10 nanometer transistor, okay? So 10 nanometer is, uh, or one micrometer is 1,000 nanometers, okay? In one micrometer, you have 110 nanometers. So in this human hair, in the width of human hair, Basically, you can have 8,000 transistors, okay? You can put 8,000 transistors right next, next to each other uh, within the width of a human hair, basically, okay? So that's where the technology is right now. And this is powerful because now uh, we can use these tiny transistors to build very powerful uh, chips, very powerful processors, basically. So as transistors get smaller, the computing power increases, basically. So what's a transistor? A transistor is a semiconductor used as a switch or amplifier. So basically, a transistor does the same job as a vacuum tube, but it's tiny. It's, it's tiny, basically. It's 10 nanometers. Okay, so on the left hand side, we see a wafer. Okay, we call this a wafer. A wafer is uh, most famously, we, it's made of uh, silicon. Okay, there are other ways to make wafers, but the most famous is silicon, basically. So we use silicon to build these wafers. Okay, these CD type uh, components and on, on them, you can print the chips, see, right next to each other. Uh, on each of these wafers, we have many, many chips, okay? They are replicas of each other. And we build many, many chips on a wafer and we dice them, we cut them into individual chips and we package them. So on the right-hand side here, you can see the chip in a package, basically, okay? So this is how we use the transistors to make the chips, okay? So how do we make wafers? So it all comes from sand, basically. Sand is, sand has silicon, right? Sand is silicon dioxide. So if you can extract silicon from sand, you can use that to build these huge silicon uh, rods, okay? This is a silicon rod in number two, then we slice them to generate wafers. So these are very, uh, 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 very narrow silicon disks, basically. And we, use, we process those silicon disks to make chips, basically. Okay. okay, so in multiple steps, we are showing nine steps here. So you, you start from sand to uh, you start from sand and go all the way to a chip, basically, an Intel chip or any other chip, basically, okay? That's how we make the chips. So the most famous 
uh, transistor technology is CMOS. Most probably you have heard of it. So I can say that about 90% of all the chips or more than 90% of all the chips made in the world are CMOS chips, okay? It's because CMOS is very widely available and uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to combine analog circuits with digital circuits in a CMOS, in a CMOS process, basically. So that makes us, that enables us to build systems, whole systems that has processors and radios, for example, communication uh, tools, okay, and combine them, put them in, in the same chip, basically. So it enables integration. Basically, we can put more and more stuff into a single chip. And as we can do this, your devices are gonna get smaller and smaller because instead of using 10 chips, now we are you're only using one chip to do the same functionality, basically. So the electronics shrink because of this, basically. And CMOS is the driving force behind this, okay? Uh, and as I said, 90-95% uh, of all the chips made in the world is CMOS based. Okay, so how, what do we do using CMOS or any other transistor, what do we do? So for example, we can design radios. Think of radar or uh, your cell phone or Wi-Fi hotspot or Bluetooth headphone, any radio, any communication tool you can uh, think of. It doesn't uh, only have to be wireless. It can be wired radios as well, like your Ethernet or your USB or your uh, mini display. Okay, so you can build all of these links using transistors. So here we have a radio example, okay? In this, you have the analog or RF part, radio frequency, radio part on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have the digital part, which is the processor, controller, and everything else, okay? So this radio is all integrated. You have the radio and the processor, the digital processor, all together, basically. So this is an example uh, that we built this, okay, when I was working in Qualcomm, okay. So this is, this is a Wi-Fi radio, okay. It has three radios. It can communicate through three radios at the same time, okay. And it has the digital baseband, digital processor. So this is an example of uh, what our chips look like now, okay? So this is 22 millimeter squares, which means that it's five millimeters on one side and four millimeters on the other side. So it's a tiny, tiny chip basically, okay? So this is a half, half a centimeter by half a centimeter chip and it can achieve uh, more than 500 megabits per second data rate, okay? And it's all integrated, okay? So everything is in it. Basically, when you use this chip, pretty much you don't need anything else outside the chip, okay, to, to get it to work, okay? So this is the power of integration. And using this chip, basically in less than two seconds, you can send or receive a whole movie. Okay, think of a two hour movie. So this chip can send or receive it in two seconds, basically, in less than two seconds. Okay, so what else do we use the transistors for? Okay, energy harvesting and sustain sustainability. Okay, so uh, silicon technology is used in uh, solar panels or uh, for energy harvesting. Okay, so it may be in the minimum scale uh, energy harvesting sensor nodes, which harvest microwatts, or it can be in the major scale, which is solar harvesting, for example. And this is 
this is being used more and more uh, as we move forward. There are smart grid applications. We come up with smart ways to conserve or preserve our energy, okay? The, to minimize the use of energy in our homes, in our cars, in wherever, everywhere you can think of basically, okay? So we use this technology, the transistor technology or electronics to achieve this now. Then we can use them, uh, this technology to build tiny machines, okay? These are microelectromechanical systems, MEMS machines. As you can see here, these are tiny, tiny machines, okay? Uh, in the order of, I don't know, 100 micrometers, okay? Or uh, half a millimeter, even less than that, 100 micrometers, basically. And we use these tiny machines to achieve many functions, okay? The most famous ones are sensing, actuation, okay? Gyroscope, we make gyroscope, accelerometers, okay? When you hold your phone up, okay? When you turn it, okay? Your phone knows it's turned around because of a gyroscope, okay? And that gyroscope is, is built using a MEMS machine, okay? So a gyroscope sends the orientation of the phone and knows that, okay, it's tilted now, okay? So these are all the applications we can use the MEMS machines with. Okay, then this is very famous now, okay? And it goes well with our school because uh, Medipol is big in uh, medical, okay? In health sciences and biomedical solutions is the combination uh, or harvesting of basically uh, medical with uh, engineering, okay? So we, we use our engineering knowledge to build medical solutions, okay? So we work very closely with doctors, okay? With medical doctors and we talk to them about problems. We talk to them how to address the problems and we come up with solutions for these problems, okay? So this is very important. So examples are hearing aids, okay? Pacemakers for your heart problems, okay? There is wireless colonoscopy, for example, rather than doing the old way painful colonoscopy, you can just uh, take a pill, okay? Which has a tiny uh, camera in it, okay? As it goes through your digestive system, you can receive pictures from your digestive system, basically. So this is uh, important. Uh, there's also wireless and disposable blood glucose analysis and infection detection, basically. Okay, so these are many, many, many ways to uh, use engineering with biomedical solutions, basically. We have many uh, projects going on uh, in this field, basically. Uh, this is obvious. I mean, we all have smartphones and smartphones use electronics, okay? It has, as I said, a MEMS gyroscope, accelerometer, it has a processor, it has multiprocessor, radios, it has uh, the uh, screen, it has the screen, screen drivers and everything. All of these are electronics that are made using uh, transistor technology, basically. And MEMS is also used in automotive industry. Automot uh, automobiles have many, many sensors now. Okay, uh, they also have gyroscopes, accelerometers. They have radars now to see around them. Okay, they have sensors, proximity sensors uh, to detect um, somebody or some, something coming very close to you. Okay, they have infrared sensors for anti-fog. They have rain sensors. They have many sensors. All of these are electronics basically. So nowadays, uh, the cost of an automobile, automobile, okay, uh, more than half of it comes from electronics rather than 
the engine and uh, the outer body of the automobile, basically. Okay, half of the value in the automobile comes from uh, electronics. Okay, so this is a summary of all we are doing. Okay, we talked about this. This is just a summary slide. Okay. Then lastly, we have IoT and smart cities. Okay, now uh, we are trying to connect everything to each other. Okay, so wherever you walk into somewhere or wherever you do something, okay, whenever you use something, okay, we want that to be interconnected with everything so that we can gather data. And we use that data to analyze and find the optimal solutions for everything, okay? It may be your power usage, or it may be your, uh, the, uh, the path you take to walk or go somewhere. We try to basically optimize everything to minimize, to minimize the energy usage and optimize the uh, the limited resources, basically, okay? And IoT and smart cities are used for this extensively. Again, uh, we use uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to analyze all the data we uh, collect, okay? So there are terabytes of data. Every single day, you're generating, generating terabytes and terabytes of data and those data are used, uh, it's processed, and it's used to do something with it, okay? To uh, basically come up with solutions. For example, we uh, monitor the health of an individual, gather, keep gathering data to come up with, uh, with the problems that that individual has and come up with solutions. Okay, this is one solution. And we have many, many, many uh, projects or many, many, many other ways of using all this data. Okay, so what do I do? Now I'm gonna briefly talk about my projects, okay? So basically I design chips, okay? My, uh, my field of interest or my field of research is designing chips, okay? So uh, in, in Medipol, I have designed many, many chips, okay? So for example, here we design chips for uh, military radios or wideband, any other wideband radio, okay? This is a wideband chip that has, uh, that's very sensitive, okay? It can receive many, very, very small signals, basically, okay? So as you can see, this chip is also five millimeter by four, four millimeters. Uh, this is the, the test card that we use to test this chip. So our chip is here. I don't know if you can see it, but it's the black one right in the kind of in the middle here. Okay, that's our chip and everything else is used to test the chip basically. So this is another uh, project that I have. It's a synthesizer. We generate frequency. Basically, uh, communication is done at different frequencies. We need to generate these frequencies. So these frequencies are generated with a synthesizer, frequency synthesizers, or PLLs, phase lock loops. So this is a, a PLL project uh, that we did. Uh, again, the test card for our PLL project. So this is an energy harvesting sensor node. So this has a tiny radio, a sensor on it, and it uh, harvests its own energy. Basically, this is not using any batteries, okay? It can harvest the energy from surrounding uh, uh, vibrations, okay? and use that energy, convert the vibration energy into electrical energy and use that energy to send the data it has on it to somewhere else basically, okay? So this is, uh, we call this uh, energy harvesting sensor node. It's all self-sufficient sensor node. You can use these 
uh, to monitor everything around you basically okay because you just need to put it somewhere and it doesn't need a battery it doesn't need anything it can extract energy and use that to send information to to a receiver basically so this chip is about two millimeters by two millimeters and that's uh, all i have actually okay so uh, these are the projects i have and there's uh, this is my field in medipol we have uh, professors from uh, different fields and different uh, research focus okay uh, there are professors who work on AI, for example, artificial intelligence. There are professors who work on communication systems. There are professors that work on optical systems, so on and so forth. So there is a wide variety of topics that we uh, work. Thank you. Of fine arts, design and architecture. And uh, I would like to introduce Vice Dean, who is Zeynep Sözen, for the lecture. Please, Zeynep. Good afternoon. I would like to uh, talk a little bit about Istanbul Medipol University School of Fine Arts, Design and Architecture. Um, for international students, we have actually um, departments that are um, in English. One is the Department of Architecture and the other is the Department of Interior Architecture, which have sections in both Turkish and English. And um, a little bit about these departments. The Department of Architecture aims to educate architects and designers who can perceive design from a multidisciplinary perspective who can comprehend and contribute to contemporary developments both at a national and international level, who can develop creative solutions, who have a solid knowledge of architectural practice, design, construction law and project management, as well as sustainability. Um, the curriculum is specifically designed as a novel, unique model that integrates architectural studio themes with technology, art, architectural history, and professional practice. And it creates a strong basis for professional life. This is also true of the interior department. Uh, all our programs are based on the philosophy of integration. So uh, this is a unique program which um, aims to integrate education with studio themes who are prepared in advance to be integrated into the subjects and themes of technology, history of art, architecture, interior architecture, and professional practice. So uh, this approach specifically allows the integration of the design process with uh, technology with building technology, historical processes, and professional practice, and the preparation of the students for a professional life. So this is a well thought out program, um, and uh, a program uh, which aims to develop digital competence in the early stages of architectural education. Um, as you know, preparation for real professional life is dependent on the early acquisition of modern management techniques in the coordination and administration of human and material resources. And uh, exactly for this reason, the courses on digital design tools and professional practice start in the first year curriculum. This is a very um, well-prepared program based on the philosophy of integration and uh, it's the only program in Turkey that provides these unique opportunities to its students and in the sense the School of Fine Arts, Design and Architecture at Istanbul University. 
uh, can be uh, evaluated as the first program that combines this design with other disciplines. Um, basically, um, it's a competence-based model for curriculum development. Uh, the students study mutual subjects for three semesters. They study the same things and after that, the curriculum is designed to help students to develop their skills. As you know, uh, students have different skills, differentiated skills. Um, they can specialize in one of the areas, one of the specialization areas, through their elective courses. These five areas are design, art, history, culture, materials and technology, professional practice, project management and legal responsibilities, and finally, environment structure and human health. So students who uh, go through mutual subjects for three semesters then can split up uh, according to their preference, according to their abilities, to the elective courses. So they can specialize in one of these or maybe two of these. And uh, this is a unique model that allows this sort of specialization at the undergraduate level. So this school is also uh, very, um, uh, places a great deal of emphasis on converting your academic knowledge into industry skills. We have relationships with industry, uh, can have uh, practical studies at the industry level. Um, it uses innovative learning techniques and advanced teaching methodologies. Now, uh, my, um, this was an introduction to the uh, school uh, and basically the English programs under the uh, School for Fine Arts, Design and Architecture. Uh, now I will proceed to my presentation. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My presentation is titled Design and Construction in the Post-Pandemic Era. I think this is very important for our professions as designers and constructors. What will happen now? Because I'm sure that the pandemic has changed many things. And I want to start by a quotation from one of the very famous architects of the 20th century because I think we are coming back to this sort of a principle. Mies van der Rohe in 1947 said, less is more. Um, and there's a story behind why he said so. Um, 
designers matter because um, have, they have always been expected to create healthy and safe buildings, um, which comprise interior and exterior spaces as well as environments. This has been an expectation from the designers. And this is very important because there has always been a relationship between health and physical space. And we will see that although uh, physical space, organization of the physical space was not the cause of this pandemic, um, physical space helped to the, the, the way the, our relationship with the physical space, how we organize it, has helped to propagate it. So again, we will have to revert back to the design of the physical space um, to mitigate the uh, consequences of this pandemic. You see, mankind has always been aware of the relationship between health and physical space. This is not new. Um, this is not new. Uh, even as early as 400 BC, Hippocrates, the Greek physician, who is called the father of medicine, believed that poor physical environments, bad air and weather caused illness and disease and believed that going to areas with fresh air and water were essential to health. So mankind has lived through these types of uh, infectious diseases throughout history and they have uh, also thought about the relationship between the disease and space, the design of space. Uh, the word quarantine is the Latin word for 40 days and it has been used uh, in the Middle Ages uh, for ships arriving from areas affected by the Black Death, the plague, because these ships were required to anchor for 40 days uh, in the port of Venice. And then, of course, there have been lots and lots of uh, epidemics and infectious diseases in the history of mankind. But those that have had a, um, a significant impact on design have been tuberculosis between 1810 to 1815, 1850 cholera, and then uh, following the um, First World War, we have the Spanish flu, uh, between 1918 and 1920. So what happened? What happened is this. Uh, before the plague of 1850, the modern sanitation systems uh, were not developed. Before this period, raw sewage flew out of buildings into the streets. Indoor plumbing systems and sewer systems developed thereafter because there was a plague. People thought that um, this is the raw sewage flowing out of buildings into streets. Likewise, the Central Park in New York was built for sanitary purposes as a sanitary officer named Frederick Law Olmsted convinced uh, the authorities to provide lungs for the city. So let's look at these. Uh, rather recent developments in the 19th century and the 20th century, tuberculosis, cholera, Spanish flu, led to the rise of a movement in architecture, which we call modernism. One of the uh, most famous architects, proponents of this movement, and uh, one of the most famous architects, of the 20th century, Le Corbusier, um, is known to have said, a house is only habitable when it's full of light and air. So there is this emphasis on light and air as early as the beginnings of the, 19th, of the 20th century. This um, modernist movement um, continued from 1920s to almost 1970s, and it emphasizes clean security environments. By cleansing, uh, which is physical and symbolical, we mean cleansing from disease and pollution. 
And this movement therefore emphasizes a purity of form, um, emphasis on geometrical forms, modern materials, and a rejection of ornamentation, which probably you have heard of, um, a trend towards what we call minimalism. Um, here we have, this is very interesting, um, a book by uh, Le Corbusier towards an architecture uh, as early as 1923, where he is giving advice about how to organize the built environment. These are his words, let me read them out to you. He says, buy only practical furniture and never buy de decorative pieces. If you want to see that taste, go into the houses of the rich, put only a few pictures on your walls and none but good ones. Keep your odds and ends in drawers or cabinets. The gramophone or the pianola or wireless will give you exact interpretations of first rate music and you will avoid catching cold in the concert hall and the frenzy of the virtuoso. Demand ventilating panes to the window in every room. Teach your children that a house is only habitable when it is full of light and air and when the walls and floors are clear to keep your floors in order to eliminate heavy furniture and thick carpets. You see, this sounds very familiar today because this is the type of advice we get today but it happened in the 1923. So mankind has been through this type of infectious disease and looking for solutions from designers. Now this uh, new pandemic, COVID-19, will also ask the designers to put emphasis on healthy environments. Uh, the pandemic has introduced new concerns about the way we design and construct. There will be new inventions. This will be providing us designers new, new opportunities for new inventions as it has done before. Maybe new trends in architecture and interior architecture, new philosophies, practical solutions, and there will be um, new opportunities as the healthy buildings market. So the healthy building will be something that people will be asking about. People will be demanding healthy buildings. How will it be? I, we can only guess now, but these are, uh, this will happen probably. There will be implications. For instance, in the office, because of the principle of social distancing, there will be a density reduction in the office. There will not be so many people in the office. Maybe this is the end of the open office, a return back to the cubicles where people can, can work individually. Maybe not so uh, quickly. There might be hybrid systems because people like to socialize partly uh, partly in the cubicles and partly socializing in a hybrid system. Probably there will be a redesign of vertical spaces. Um, there will be screening entrances because you want to check if people entering your building have high fever. And in the office, probably there will be surfaces preventing virus transmission. Um, a return of natural materials like wood, bamboo, oak, cork, copper, bronze, quartz, which are much healthier. There will be an emphasis on the outdoor space, fresh air, open air. In the office, you want to open your windows so you can get fresh air. And an emphasis on hygiene, no touch faucets, no touch doors, automatic doors, uh, better ventilation systems by polar ionization, removing mold, viruses, bacteria, or voice activated elevators you don't want to touch anywhere. Maybe smaller, but more elevators in the building. What about the house? 
Now you have felt that your house has partly become your office. As students, it has become your classroom. For working people, this has partly become our office. So probably we will be needing more energy efficient homes uh, with zero carbon standards, zero emission. And uh, you have also felt that as students probably you want a separate working space. We need maybe a, a flexible planning where you can separate working spaces for students working in the home or for adults who have to work online from their home offices. You might want to isolate people who have some sort of an illness. So you might want isolated rooms, separate rooms. So we need, you know, flexible planning for our homes. You want insulation for noise control. You don't want your brother or sister to be yelling around when you are working. More insulation, sound insulation, but you want also fresh air. You want open spaces, you want outside air, air hygiene. You want more circulation spaces. As in the office, you will be looking for antimicrobial surfaces. You don't want to touch anywhere. Probably you will be looking for electronic keys and of course, very powerful internet access. This will be one of the major, this will be also necessity for offices. We want very good and continuous internet access, powerful internet access. What about the interior design implications? As we said, um, probably we will be needing better air purifiers. We will be needing virus resistant materials for flooring and services. Usage of natural materials, as we said, in the general um, trends for design. Um, a return to natural materials such as wood, bamboo, oak, cork, copper, bronze, quartz on faucets, door handles, cabinet knobs. And you will want um, auto cleaning technologies in the bathroom or maybe integrated inside furniture inside your cabinets. You want cleaning technologies, ultraviolet lights smart toilets that clean themselves and faucets that clean themselves, maybe voice control for the technology in your home. Um, hygienic storage spaces will be more important today because you want to store uh, whatever you buy in a more hygienic uh, environment. And of course, access to the green by vertical gar gardens and green. So here we come back to uh, what Ms. van der Rohe said, less is more, less will be more in terms of both architectural design and interior design. And of course, we come to the construction side of it. We design, but then we also construct what will happen on the construction site. Um, in order to reduce the density of workers or working people uh, on the site, probably there will be more automation on the site. Um, support from drones, from robots. This is the subject of a special area which is called robotics in construction. This will be important. Um, construction work probably will be controlled remotely as we work uh, online in our homes. Construction work can also be controlled remotely and maybe there will be prefabricated construction. That means that not on the site but modules or cu cubicles uh, will be built in a healthy environment like factories. We will be producing them and we will be carrying them, transporting them to the site to assemble them there. A um, major function of this will be the reduction of construction time and it means that people will not have to 
uh, on the site for a very long time. So these are the estimates for construction. And uh, what about these people, these professionals working together? They will be working together. There is a design team, there is a construction team. The design team, of course, comprises architects, interior designers, engineers, mechanical engineers, civil engineers, uh, electrical engineers. They all design and then the schools to decide to reconstruct. How will they be able to work together? Um, as we have done in our uh, normal uh, remote ways of working, uh, there will be a shifting to remote ways of working again in design. Um, design professionals will be working together remotely. Design teams, engineers will be relying on digital collaboration tools such as building information modeling, call this BIM, 4D and 5D simulation and progress tracking. And this is, I want to end my uh, presentation by uh, telling you that this is the sort of building, the sort of education we provide you at the School of Architecture. We can provide you with the um, basic skills and the technology of building information modeling for the 5D simulation and progress tracking. So I'm sure that uh, in Medipol University of Fine Arts, Design and Architecture, you will be kept up to date with the latest developments in the world. So I thank you and I wish you all the success in your future professional lives. Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Benin Dikman. Uh, I am assistant professor at Istanbul Medipol University School of Dentistry. Uh, I will talk about dentistry with you today. Uh, I know that you have many questions in your mind. You are definitely right. Uh, I think some of these questions will be clarified during this presentation. First of all, why study in Turkey, in Istanbul? Istanbul has magnificent natural beauties and rich culture. For that reason, it's visited by tourists from many different countries. Combining the Asian and the European continents makes Istanbul unique. Uh, and this city always fascinates its visitors. I think that you will love living in Istanbul. Secondly, why study in Istanbul Medipol University? Istanbul Medipol University is providing educational services to approximately 1,200 Turkey international students from 75 different countries. This university is one of the leading universities in Turkey with an alive campus life. There are many social and cultural activities for students in our campus. What about dentistry? Why be a dentist? It's a crucial question. Uh, the answer of this question is simple, actually. When you become a dentist, you will be not only a doctor, but also an engineer and an artist. What does it mean? You will become a doctor since dentists are treating patients. Patients are coming with pain to dentists and dentists can relieve this pain. A dentist can face many medical conditions. Uh, there are various soft and hard, hard tissue diseases that can be seen in the mouth. Some examples of these diseases are cited on the slide. Uh, it's pleasing 
to be the person, to be the one who heals the patient, it is amazing feeling for us. What about engineering? When there is a loss of tooth structure, dentists should restore the aesthetics and functionality. Like any load-bearing structure, a dental restoration uh, should withstand uh, a certain load and should last for a long time. When chewing, many forces are coming to the restoration and uh, to the tooth. Uh, the dentist should think if the restoration can withstand these forces or not. According to the answer of this question, the dentist selects um, the type of the restorative material or the dentist can change the treatment plan. For that reason, a dentist should think like an engineer during treatment plan. And lastly, a dentist should act like an artist during treatment since aesthetics is very important for patients. Uh, when a dentist is making a dental restoration, this restoration should be similar to the natural tooth of the patient. Uh, providing a natural tooth appearance with an artificial material is an art actually. Uh, here are some examples of my treatments. The patients on the left side had many decays on their anterior teeth, on their front teeth. I cleaned the decays, I prepared the teeth, and after that, I restored them with an aesthetic restorative material, with a composite material. Uh, you can see here the natural tooth appearance. The patients on the middle had broken anterior teeth. Here I didn't make any preparation. I didn't cut teeth. I didn't um, make any damage to teeth. I only added the restorative material and the patient was very happy about the uh, result of the treatment. The patient on the bottom uh, was very unhappy uh, with the color of his teeth. Uh, I applied tooth whitening to this patient and the result was excellent. And the patient on the right side had a gap between two anterior, two front teeth, which is called diastema. I closed this diastema with an aesthetic restorative material without making any damage to the teeth of this patient. These patients started to smile again after the treatment. This was an amazing feeling for us. Dentistry is a difficult job. It's not easy, but to be the person who heals the patient, to be the person who relieves the pain of the patient and to be the one who makes the patient smile again. These feelings are magnificent for us. And here is, I think, the most important question. Why study dentistry in Istanbul Medipol University? The priority of Istanbul Medipol University School of Dentistry is to ensure a high level of education by providing the students with the most up-to-date information and technological development. The duration of education in School of Dentistry is five years, preceded by one year English teaching for those who fails proficiency exam. Uh, in the first three years, um, 
Training is carried out on artificial patients. There are a total of 140 artificial patients in our simulation laboratory. Students can practice for various dental treatments on these models and they can watch the demonstrations made by teachers uh, through their monitors in their unit. Here is a picture of our simulation laboratory, which is one of the largest laboratories in Turkey. Here is a student uh, who treats an artificial patient. What about teaching practices? Our curriculum provides students with opportunities to learn the fundamental principles significant to the entire body of dental knowledge. Students are expected to learn basic health sciences, get proficiency in clinical skills, and develop an understanding of professional and ethical principles, as well as reasoning and learning critical decision meaning skills that will enable them to implement the dental knowledge base. In the last two years, students are treating real patients in our hospital under the supervision of experienced faculty members. The fourth and fifth year dental students perform both general dentistry and specialized procedures. The dental education model approved by the Association for Dental Education in Europe is conducted in Istanbul Medipol University faculty. The most important purpose of this new education model is to help the Istanbul Medipol University students gain research and individual learning skills in both principle and practice during the academic year. We will be very happy to see you uh, in our university. And if you select our university, our international office will be always there for you. Here is a website. You can find any necessary information about uh, student admission procedures on this website. You can learn tuition fees, you can learn scholarship opportunities, etc. All of them are cited uh, on this website. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, you can ask it now. Hello, dear prospective students. Thank you for joining us here at Study in Turkey Virtual Fair. I'm here to first introduce you to our school and university, but also to share some of my first-hand experience uh, having been an international student myself. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Doğa Çöl. I am a research assistant in the Faculty of Communication at Istanbul Medipol University. Um, I want to talk about what Istanbul and Medipol University can offer you. And Istanbul is one of the most amazing cities in the world. I say that having been to many amazing cities, people usually talk about. And no matter what you study or what you want to do, you will, and I guarantee that, uh, find it in this city. I'm sure you've uh, looked it up on the internet or even been to Istanbul, but living here is just something else. And yes, that means it can sometimes get overwhelming for people from smaller cities. But once you get used to it, you will fall in love with it. Um, during your studies here in Istanbul, try to explore the city uh, both alone and with friends and try to discover new things as I'm sure you'll find something new every day. So Istanbul Medipo University is located in the middle of our beautiful city on the Anatolian side overlooking the European side on top of a hill and next to the second of the three bridges that connect both sides. That means it is easy getting to where you want to be. 
if the traffic is too much, and it might be, you can sometimes take the ferry across or take the bus to the subway and train lines with ease. Uh, Faculty of Communication is located on the southern campus in a huge building with many possibilities for the future. Uh, we have five different programs, journalism, uh, media and vi visual arts, new media and communication, radio, television and cinema, and public relations and advertisement, which is available in both Turkish and in English. Our faculty is unique because none of the programs are isolated. They are all located in the same building and share many core classes required for education and communications. Another great thing about our faculty is that we have a media center dedicated to all aspects of communication that is open to all our students in all the programs. In our media center, which is located in the Southern campus as well, we have a green screen studio, a TV studio with a control room, a movie theater, both a radio and an audio recording studio, a PR workshop room, a photography studio, Mac and PC labs, and last but not least, a news center. It is also possible to work in the media center as an intern student uh, managing and lending all of the various production equipment we have for students to help with their class projects. Uh, it is essential to know that all the programs in the Faculty of Communication work together and all of our students can learn about all aspects of communication and visual, audiovisual arts uh, by practicing uh, doing on-hand stuff. Before uh, sharing my experience as an international student, I want you to watch this little clip of our faculty so that you can see better. So, now to talk about my experience as an international student. I became an international student at a very young age, uh, during high school actually. I went to a country where I'd never been before and lived with a family I'd never met before until graduation from high school. And after graduating, I went to Montreal to study film at Concordia University. Again, I had never been to Montreal before, so my life was changing fast, and I had to adapt to all of this change along with studying hard as I did not want to fail. And that's why I want to give a few tips uh, of the things I learned there, because I believe these are very important for uh, all kinds of international students, not just those studying in the Faculty of Communication. Um, I realized fast that study and life balance is actually much more impo important to international students uh, than students who are from the same country or the city. It is because apart from the fact that you start a new life at university, you also need to adapt to a new life in a new city with a new culture 
and these things are intimidating at first and many people get discouraged at this stage actually but let me tell you that i did not regret being an international student it was uh, a great experience and if you keep in mind your goals and pursue your interests both in and outside of school as well as staying curious which is very important uh, it will be an experience you will never forget so uh, that's what i want to share with you i want to share with you a few things i've learned about being abroad continuously for more than six years uh, so let us start with a new country new city new culture part of the journey um, the important thing to keep in mind is being uh, open-minded and gather new friends to uh, have to to not have homesickness this is actually very common in international students and many people get scared about it beforehand and it does happen to some people and it might actually happen to everyone to some extent but like i said if you if you keep an open mind and pursue your interests and uh, do not forget your goals that homesickness will go away once you go home for a, you know a vacation or at at the winter break or at the summer break and being homesick is not a given if you try new things and be open about adapting to the city and to the country of course when i first found myself in a country with no friends i quickly prepared myself a schedule i did not try to force anything to happen uh, because I knew that that would work uh, from uh, people's experiences uh, that came before me. I made a schedule that included studying and a leisure time. My, that free time is crucial, actually. Uh, many people skip that st step as well. Sometimes they get uh, too crammed up in their studies and forget that they should actually enjoy their free time, uh, especially when you're out of your country and when you're abroad. I decided to study systematically when I came home from class. This way I did not need to cram all night to get an essay ready for the morning. Uh, my weekends were dedicated to cleaning and organizing my room, having a good breakfast on both days of the weekend and going at least once on the weekend. Uh, that's actually very good for you, um, even if you don't want to do anything. It, once you get the discipline, correctly, then you will, you will not find that you're homesick. Um, I usually went out to see films as I love films, but you can do whatever you like as long as it is time away from your studies or worries. I am a musician, so I joined an orchestra uh, that meant two days out of the week were spent in practice. I also included my practice hours on my daily schedule, so I, you know, organized myself accordingly. I also met a few people who wanted to make films like me, so we started working together on our projects uh, to make films. I also worked on other people's projects uh, so that I was you know, building a portfolio without even trying because it just happened naturally, which is also good. All the other free time was left for me to read and learn new things and just hang out with friends. And this way I always had something to do uh, but not in a way that everything felt stressful. Uh, I was entirely busy in a way that I had no time to be homesick. Of course, this varies from person to person, and you might find that a different approach would suit you better. But the important thing here is to keep yourself occupied with things that interest you in both your studies and your free time. So it's important to select these correctly according to your own character or on your own needs and interests. It is also essential to learn the language of the country you're in and this will not help uh, with keeping, this will not only help uh, with keeping homesickness at bay, uh, it will also be beneficial for you as you gain another language and uh, a new language means a new mindset, new resources, and valuable conversations with people you otherwise would not have been able to communicate with, right? And the most important thing about learning the language is uh, because you feel your day-to-day -day activities will be easier for you. Going to the market, sightseeing around the city, and so on, having new friends, 
And what better way is there to learn a language in the country that it is spoken in? It's actually very easy. You don't even realize once you uh, have friends that speak that language all the time around you. And it's called immersion. You should immerse yourself in the culture. And that way you will have a, a better experience in general. And next up, uh, I want to tell you about my uh, experiences as a student, as a film student. Uh, my experience may prove useful to you if you select a similar field of study or faculty. Uh, the first thing I want to share with you about studying in a single program is that you do not want to limit yourself or try to uh, specialize yet. Your specialization should come after you graduate. I see many students who do this, they want to specialize immediately on the first year and then realize after three years that they didn't want to do that thing anymore. They wanted to do something else in their field. And uh, of course, this is only relevant to specific fields of study as other fields may be single-minded by definition. Uh, however, I believe this suits almost all areas. For example, if you study film, try to learn and be curious about disciplines related to film. And this is the most important part, uh, being curious and not being overwhelmed. These th new things, these things are very important. This way I was, you know, uh, I studied in a theoretical program, but outside of my studies, I worked in film sets uh, composed music for various projects, and even designed a few film, film posters. This way I was always curious about learning new things, uh, which is important, new interests, uh, and even, you know, uh, but you should not forget the same, of course, jack of all trades, master of none. So don't get overwhelmed, ever, because if you find yourself doing uh, projects more than you can, you know, if you bite more than you can chew, then you're going to get homesick. You're going to get, uh, you, you, you're going to want to quit. Okay. And this happens to almost all students, actually. Um, either, either or. Either they get overwhelmed doing too much or they get bored doing nothing. So it's, it's, it's really um, wise to find that balance. And uh, actually, I, for example, have been a w victim of this. At one point in university, I was working on so many things that I was exhausted all the time and I did not have the mental well-being to do all of them at once. So I find that finding that balance is extremely important for a student. Also, as the years go on, uh, you might find interests develop and evolve into new things. Uh, I was interested more in the production side of things in the beginning of my studies, but as time went on, I became interested in post-production. And on the other hand, my interest in theory never changed. So there are always more than a few possibilities. That's why you should not limit yourself during your bachelor's degree. It's important to keep an open mind and stay curious and be curious. That's very important so that you don't get bored and you don't get overwhelmed. Um, don't be afraid of changing your interests either. You know, it's always possible to transfer to uh, like transfer between programs or even faculties if you feel you have developed interests outside of your field of study. And that's to keep yourself going and being disciplined. It's very important so that you don't fall into the negativity side of things. Finally, I would like also like to address a problem that many students have, and this is very important as well. Uh, not only international students, and that is expecting to learn everything from your professors, your teachers, your mentors, your TAs, you know, um, teachers in general in any study, discipline, or field cannot teach you everything you need to know about a particular occupation. Uh, at university, even the most advanced courses at the pre-graduate bachelor's degree level are introductory. And your instructors will lecture about the subjects and in practical classes, you will actually try to do some things on your own, but don't forget that this is only the base level. Uh, you need to go on and research more about the subjects that interest you or things that you want to do. Only if you're curious enough, will you develop invaluable skills. You know, certainly your instructors will do and show you enough to get the ball rolling, 
you can actually get by with the things you'll learn in class alone. But if you want to shine and actually want to do something, you need to always remember to become better at the things you currently are able to do. And that doesn't mean that you always have to be better than someone else. You only need to be better than your past self. And uh, what I did was, for example, as a film student in classes every week uh, for a certain one, like one class, we would watch a film in class, get lectured on it. But in that certain, for example, in film history, uh, we see a movie from 1942, but there are so many other movies that fall into that decade, which are as important. And usually your instructors tell you like, watch these films as well. And, you know, read about these directors, read about these actors and writers. And some people just watch the film, be in class, get an A, pass. But what about after school, right? It's also nice to see all those 10 films. And um, this is actually true for many programs. If you're in journalism, you should re read more than you're given, right? Um, of course, you can pass the class with what you're given. But if you do just a bit more and find your curiosity in that field, you know, you will not fail after school. So that's what I tried to do. And I do not regret it at all. I'm really happy with it. I came back to my country as happy as I left it, you know, and, you know, it's, it's important. So to please stay curious throughout your studies and your life so that you don't regret it. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I hope all of you are fine. I am Gamze Uçak. Today, I and my dear colleague, Cemre Yavuz, will give you information about the preparatory school and its general structure, as well as the assessment system, lecturers, and student voice. So, dear Murat Cildiz is the general co coordinator of our preparatory school. So let's begin. Our preparatory school actually consists of four tracks. So instead of two halves or two semesters, the academic year is divided into four tracks. Within each track, a higher level of English is taught. I will give more details about the levels in the following slides. Uh, here, as you can see, each track lasts about seven and a half or eight and a half weeks. So last year, the division of the four tracks was as follow. We had a total of uh, 34 weeks with eight and a half weeks in each track. And the first and last days of the tracks were specified as follows. As you see between tracks two and three, we have a 14 days of holiday. Actually, you and we will appreciate this holiday a lot. Uh, so this year the track division is not certain yet due to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, as you know, nothing is certain nowadays, unfortunately. But the division will be announced uh, when it's finalized, actually. Yeah, as you see, we have 34 weeks. Okay, as I said, each track, a higher level of English is taught. So this is our level-based system. So what do we do? Basically, at the beginning of the academic year, students take proficiency exam, and if your score is above 75, you are exempted from the preparatory school, which means you don't need to study in the preparatory school. But if your score is below 75, you will be placed according to your level. So it is not like a random uh, assignment, it is according to your score. So you will either start with a low level or medium level or a high level. So in each track, you will be taught in a higher level. So as you see, low starters, they start with A1 level in the first track, and then they finish with B2 level in the fourth track. Similarly, medium level students start with A2 level in the first track, and then they finish at uh, B2 level in the fourth track. And the high level of students, sorry, they start with the B1 level, and then they finish with B2 level. So, as you see, there are really similar levels. This B2, le B2 plus level actually is not something like a higher level. It's like the TOEFL track. So 
even if you are a low level student or medium level student, you will have the same information with high level students at the end of the tracks. So uh, one important thing to note here is that possibly uh, at the end of each track, according to your assessment scores about which Jamie Hojan will give more details, you can change uh, classes, but you cannot change between the levels. So, for example, if you started as low 101 class, you can move to low 108 class, but you cannot move to medium level class. Uh, so, if you started with low level, you will finish and continue and finish with low level, or if you started with the medium level, you will continue and finish with the medium level. Uh, the reason for that is actually at the beginning of the academic year, you buy your books and you are taught according to your level. As you see, there are some changes, especially in the first track and the second track about the levels. So when you try, uh, we cannot change the levels actually because of this. Another point is that you will not repeat the same level. Let's say, of course, we hope not, uh, your scores are very low. You will continue with the next level nonetheless. So there is no chance to repeat the A1 level or not a chance, but there's no luxury to repeat this level. So. Okay, I guess the, this summarizes all I wanted to share. Now I will leave the floor to Jemre Hojam and she will talk about the terminology, assessment lectures and the student voice. So Jemre Hojam, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you Hojam. Uh, can you please uh, show me the details? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. So, um, this year we started ESP classes and it stands for English for Specific Purposes, uh, which means that actually uh, we divide uh, our prep school students according to their departments so that they can practice the um, department-based terminology, department-based vocabulary and department-based uh, content topics before they go to the uh, departments. So um, this is a great opportunity actually uh, for, the, the, for the prep students because you're going to be familiar with the uh, content topics and the vocabulary before you start departments. Um, well, actually, basically this means that uh, if you're a psychology student, let's say, that means uh, one day in every week, you're gonna uh, learn about psychology related topics and vocabulary everything with your psychology classmates let's say yeah so can you please yeah well John, thank you let's mm -hmm. talk about assessments and evaluation uh, in medical university we, there are lots of opportunities to prove that uh, you're improving your english uh, language let's say so we as you can see on the screen right now there's no one exam system in here so which means that we have uh, other assignments other like projects uh, online homeworks or uh, homeworks from the books uh, and also we have written tasks which is also called portfolios so all of these things uh, will you know um, give you a final grade at the end of the uh, year and you will be graduated according to those uh, according to your success in those different things. So, uh, Hojam, can you please of go course, to the next slide? Because in, in here I will talk about uh, the assessment system in detail. So at the uh, top of the screen you can see teachers assess assessments, which is also called TA in short. So that means uh, your teachers will be grading your participation in the class. So not only your knowledge uh, of English language, but also how you can practice it, how in the lessons uh, matters in the assessment uh, process. So uh, uh, participation means that like uh, if you just participate in the discussion sections, if you practice speaking, if you ask questions, if you answer the questions during the lesson, this is called participation and you will be graded according to your performance in that process. Also, uh, mid -track, we have mid track exam. Uh, so Gamzo Jam mentioned about it. The one track consists of uh, like seven and a half or eight and a half weeks. So at, in the middle of the each track, we have mid track exam, which is also called MT. So we, it's basically a paper-based exam, which uh, assess your um, grammar knowledge, vocabulary knowledge, reading skills, and uh, 
writing skills. And at the end of the each track, we have a TAT, which is a track achievement test. And it is the same thing actually with the mid-track exam. It is also paper-based, but it, it covers more uh, topics, of course. So uh, as I also mentioned earlier, we have projects. So in each track, we have a different project, but we try to uh, follow some department related topics in those projects so that you can be uh, prepared enough before you go to your departments. Also, we have a written task, uh, which makes your portfolio. Uh, in those portfolios, you're gonna practice writing some paragraphs, some essays, uh, and then you will be graded according to your portfolio uh, performance. And we have ESP classes, I talked about it earlier. It means English for specific purposes. So uh, every week we, uh, you actually, come together with your uh, department classmates, let's say, and then you, can, you practice uh, department related content in those classes. Of course, you will be uh, assessed in those classes as well by ESP teachers. Also, we have vocabulary test, vocabulary exam, which is separate, which is a separate exam actually. It's different from mid track exam and track achievement exam. And in, those, in this ESP class, we have uh, vocabulary tests so that we can assess your uh, terminology knowledge, let's say. Hojam, can you please skip to the next one? Sure. Yeah, let's talk about, uh, actually, this is one of the greatest uh, topics that I like to mention because uh, two years ago, uh, we, our school was certified and accredited by Pearson uh, which means that our school was evaluated in terms of organizational structure, learning outcomes, assessments, and evaluation. Um, please, next one, John. So what does accreditation means for, mean for students? So that means our student will receive, at the end of the, re at the, end of the year, our school re will receive a certificate that proves that they have graduated from a quality assured school. So uh, this certificate will also provide our students with more opportunities. Like you can, you can uh, show that your academic and professional qualifications, you have those qualifications. And also Pearson collaborates with more than 1,000 institutions, which means that you can use that certificate in those institutions as well, because uh, they accept your certificate. So uh, I want to talk about the lectures at our school. This is the lovely photograph of our team. So we have uh, 117 lectures in the prep school and our lecture, lecturers uh, have different kinds of qualification and expertise in education. 83% uh, of our teachers, they have master's degrees and 17% uh, of our teachers are doing master's degrees right now and 5% of our teachers are doing their PhD degrees and all of our teachers they have field related certifications in different areas of education. So that shows that uh, we as teachers uh, like learning day by day and we learn we, we don't stop learning so that's why we will like we want you to be uh, we, we want you to take us as a role model and please don't stop learning like we do. Rajan, can you please skip? First. Yeah, student's voice. We have a student's voice system, which is really nice actually, because uh, we care about feedback actually in our school. Uh, not only teachers, but also students can give feedback in our school, which means that in the beginning of each track, we select actually the class the students select their uh, class representative and then uh, these representatives uh, come together in, a, in, in certain times and they give feedback or they can talk about their problems, they can uh, share some solutions uh, to, to their classmates or uh, school friends and uh, we do this so that we can so try to solve our students' uh, problems or make have a better education in our school. So we can go to the next one, I guess. So yes, for more information, you can visit our language school website, uh, which you can see in, on the screen. And 
there's a student's plans book uh, on our website. You can uh, check it out as well. Um, I guess that's all. Ganzo Jam, would you like to add something? No, Jam, thank you. I guess this was very concise. Yeah. Uh, so if there's no question. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then we, we, uh, we say thank you for listening.